Very blessed morning to one and all. Today we are continuing our meditation and study of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 9, focusing on the ministry of the 12 disciples. And I've entitled this Trusting God in Gospel Ministry. Indeed, there are many times in our ministry, whether you are in full-time ministry or otherwise, all of us are called to the gospel ministry. And there are many times when we need to trust God, or rather every day we need to be trusting God, because there will be situations and occasions when from the man's perspective, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Verse 1 in Luke chapter 9 Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So here we see the Jesus, right? Not just himself preaching the gospel everywhere uh, around the area of Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee, but also starting to send out his 12 disciples to the region, showing them how to trust God in serving God and preaching the word. And he gave them power and authority over all diseases to cure, uh, over all devils and to cure diseases, and send them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. In other words, exactly what Jesus did. The disciples are to replicate the ministry. And it's the same for all of us. All of us who have come into the kingdom of Christ, are called to be followers of Jesus, that we too should follow the example of Christ to give our lives to serve the Lord and to preach the kingdom of God. And so we see, firstly, that they were called, secondly, they were empowered, and thirdly, they were sent. Right? The call, firstly, starts with an internal call and also followed by an external call. Now, what is an internal call? First, the internal call starts with a call to Christ, that all of us must be called to trust in Jesus first as our Saviour. And then as we grow in our faith, we commit ourselves to follow Christ more closely. And we start calling Him our Lord and our Master. Right? We, we start to learn how to be a Christian and how to be more committed to Christ and how to give every day of our life to follow Jesus and to be his disciple. So first, a follower of Christ, a call to Christ rather, to trust in Christ, and secondly, a call to submit to Jesus as our Saviour and Lord. And of course, there is also a call to full-time ministry. And this is the context here of the 12 disciples, that they have left their jobs, their full-time jobs, They have left their family to follow Jesus, to go from place to place, village to village, city to city, region to region with Jesus in order to preach the gospel and to do the work of God. And of course, before you can commit yourself to do that, there are questions, there are doubts, there are struggles, right? Now, of course, there are often difficulties about these questions, who am I? Who am I to serve the Lord? Who am I? I'm a sinner. I still have many sins. Who am I? Do I have a credibility to be a full-time minister of God? Who am I? Will people laugh at me when I say that I'm going to be serving the Lord full-time? What if I fail as a minister? What if I fail as a pastor? So these are the questions and doubts. Do I have what it takes to follow Christ? Do I have the perseverance? Do I have the financial resources? We struggle with all these questions. And then there are the horror stories, right? I remember when I shared with my friend uh, that I'm going to go full-time and uh, I'm going to leave my job. I was very well paid then um, in a secular job. And um, my friend told me about her relative who left a job and then went full-time ministry and eventually he denounced Christ before he died. Right? So that was quite discouraging for me. Right? But 
uh, these are things that happen, right? And there was another pastor who shared about how his friend, mid-career, left his job that was paying well and providing for his family, went into full-time ministry, served in his church, and then he got criticized by his church. And he found the going really, really, really tough. And he was so discouraged and he said, if this is what full-time ministry is all about, if this is how they treat pastors, I give up, I quit. I'm not going to be a pastor. And he left the pastoral ministry. So there are all these horror stories right, that you hear from time to time about the pastoral ministry. And then there is the external call, meaning the call that comes from the congregation to call the particular person to come into full-time ministry. The external call comes when the congregation recognizes the gifts of a person who have grown up in the midst, who has ministered and served in the midst, and who has used his gifts or her gifts to share the word, whether with children or with adults or in evangelism right, or in personal ministry counselling and things like that. And the congregation prays for this person, that the Lord will use him or her full-time right, for the glory of God. And the congregation is prepared to give sacrificially in order to enable this person to exercise his or her gifts in the full-time ministry. And when he or she shares an internal call that he or she has received from Christ or from God, the congregation confirms by issuing an external call. Right? So I hope you understand the internal call and then the external call. And this is what happens in the case of everyone who comes into full-time ministry. Dave Harvey, in his book entitled, Am I Called?, wrote, God takes an ordinary man, ordinary man. Pastors are not special people. Like you read in the Bible, Moses, right? Abraham, they're ordinary people. We're just ordinary people, flesh and blood. But God takes an ordinary man, carves out his character, grants him some grace, trains him with trials, <coughs> zaps him with zeal. Right? Give him the zeal, move him, sh shakes him up. Right? And... Um, revives his spirit, grant him the strength, corners him in circumstances, difficult times, to test him, to make him stronger, so that he can withstand the storms that will come in his ministry. Then you've got a pastor. Every pastor will go through trials, criticisms, problems in the ministry, problems at home, problems in the community. So he called the 12 disciples empowered them and gave them authority over all the devils and to cure diseases to encourage them. Right? God often encourages the young ministers and gives them some initial success so that they will continue to persevere. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and do the same ministries as Jesus had done. And the next few verses tells us that they are to trust God to provide like the doubts that the full-time ministers always have at the beginning of the ministries. Will I have enough to provide for myself and for my family? And this takes a leap of faith, a great jump in faith to trust God, that God is a God who loves us. He loves His people and He loves His church. He wants His church to prosper and He will provide for the ministers of God. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves, nor scrip, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. Don't take extra. And whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide, and thence depart. Right. So, in this case, they have Jesus with them. Right. Jesus who can do miracles. Great miracles. And they can trust that Jesus as the Son of God will also provide for them. But on top of that, they are to go to the various homes, or rather Jesus was not with them, He sent them out to the various regions, right? They are to trust and knock on doors if there be open doors, people who are hospitable, who are willing to take them in. They are to go and accept the hospitality. They are not to feel ashamed that they have to accept 
the free accommodation, the free food that they will be invited to partake of. They gave up the jobs, they have no income, they have to trust God to provide for their material needs by the host families. In whatsoever house, they enter, abide, and then depart. Right. But it's not easy to trust God to provide. It's easy to say, but it's not easy to trust God, especially in Singapore, where it's so expensive. Right? Where most houses are so small, there are no spare rooms. Right? Even to accommodate foreign guests or visiting pastors. It's not easy to trust God to provide. William Borden, he was the heir of Borden Dairy Estates, rich family, but his heart was not on the riches. His heart was not on taking over his father's business, the dairy business, right? but his heart was on the gospel of Jesus Christ. When he went to Yale, the first year in Yale University, he found that there were very, very few Christians among the boys, among the young men. In fact, most of the young men in the university come from rich families. They were not interested in the gospel. They were only interested in gambling, playing, right, meeting with girls. They're not interested in partying, the things of the world, entertainment, just like today. Right? They're not interested in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he grabbed a friend who is a Christian, and together they started the first prayer meeting, the morning prayer and the reading of scriptures in Yale. Just two of them. And slowly the group grew. The next day, they had one more. Christian who joined them. And then slowly it grew larger and larger. And by the time he finished his final year, there were, there were about 75% of the boys every morning having prayer meeting in Yale. 1,000, imagine 1,000 students in Yale joining the prayer meeting from it started with just two persons. And that's what he did. Not, he, not what he did, or rather the Holy Spirit moved among the students in Yale. And not only that, he led by example. In the nights, he would go to Chicago town and meet up with the poor people and those who are in the streets. And he would bring them into the restaurants, into the mission house, offer them hot soup, offer them bread, and then share the gospel with them. And in that process, many people came to know the Lord. Right. <clears throat> and he wrote, even during this time, he knew that he was going to be a missionary, and he set his heart to go to Jiangsu, China. And he, he wrote back to his father, right, before he graduated from Yale, that I want to be a missionary. Right. And so he wrote in his Bible the first two words, no reserves. No reserves. Just trusting the Lord. No reserves. He's not falling back on the money of his father. He has no reserves whatsoever. He's just going to trust the Lord. And upon graduation, he felt God's call to be a missionary to Jiangsu. And he wrote to his dad. Yeah, I've said that already. And then, upon graduation, he knew that he wanted to go to Jiangsu and his father would not be supporting his ministry. He also turned down all the high-paying jobs and he wrote down no retreats in the Bible, the next two words. He went to Egypt to learn Arabic in order to prepare himself to reach the group of people, the Arabic-speaking people in Jiangsu. He caught a bug there and within a month, he died. But before he died, he wrote in his Bible, last two words, no regrets. No reserves, no retreats, no regrets. He gave his life to serve God, trusting God to provide for all that he needs in the ministry. God was pleased to call him home early because he has done well, because he has saved so many people in his ministry, in the university. God says, come home and rest. You've worked very hard. Let other people work harder, all right? I'm going to call the other people into the ministry. And through his inspired story, many others answered the call. Many other young men answered the call to be missionaries to Jiangsu, to China, and they continued 
the gospel work over there. The story of Borden was published in the tracts, distributed to Jiangsu, and also led many to trust in the Lord. It's not easy to trust God. But when the Lord calls you, you know you can trust Him. Verse 5, and whatsoever, whosoever will not receive you, we move on in Luke chapter 9. When you go out of the city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And here is a warning right, for those who will not receive the ministers of God, those who reject rather the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior that is preached will be judged. It will be a testimony against them. And that is something that we can trust the Lord. So don't feel bad you know, when people reject you or they reject the gospel when you share with them. Right? They're not rejecting you. They are rejecting Christ. Right? And so the Lord will judge the people who choose to reject Christ. So don't take it personally. Right? So we have to also trust God with the results. Verse 6, They departed, went through the towns, preaching the gospel, healing everywhere. And God greatly blessed their preaching, healing ministries, and they had no idea how powerful the gospel was. Because Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11 is the promise. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto thee void, unto me void. This is God speaking. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Isaiah 55, verse 11. Then indeed, Jonah 2 9 tells us salvation is of the Lord. It is God who chooses when he will call, when he will save, and whom he will save. But our job is to just spread the gospel far and wide. Right? Spread the seed of the gospel, sow the seed. And sometimes our ministry assessment can be wrong. We think that we are failures. And very often we can feel discouraged even in our ministries. But sometimes our assessment can be wrong. The story was told of Dr. William Leslie, who in 1912 became a medical missionary to the tribal people in a remote corner of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And he was there for 17 years. But in the 17 years, he had ups and downs in his ministry. Eventually, he had a fallout with some of the tribal chiefs who told him to leave the village. So after 17 years, he felt that he was a failure. During the 17 years, he preached the gospel. He set up schools. He started the education process of young children. Many of them benefited from his school education. Many of them learned to read and write and to read the Bible. But he thought that he was a failure. He felt he went back, in fact, to the U.S., a very discouraged man, believing that he failed to make an impact for Christ. In fact, after he went back to the U.S., nine years later, he died. So throughout his life, he never saw the fruit of his labor. Fast forward 2010, almost 100 years later, a team led by Eric Ramsey with Tom Cox World Ministries found a network in, around the region that William Wesley, even Leslie ministered in, a network of reproducing churches in the dense jungles across the river from Van Gogh, where he was stationed, Dr. Leslie was stationed nearly a century earlier. And the tribes credited Dr. Leslie and other missionaries who came after him, who continued to sow and water the gospel seed among them. And so this story tells us that we never know the power of the gospel, just a word that you speak, just a message that you send, a tract that you give up. There were people who were saved by the tracts. There were people who were saved by the messages, by the invitations that you sent to them. There were people who learned to trust God because of your testimony in Christ. So don't underestimate. Don't assess wrongly the power of the gospel, the power of your witness, of your true witness in and among your sphere of influence, whether in your homes, in the community, or in your workplace or in your schools. Right? Next, we are to trust God despite the opposition and danger. 
Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him and he was perplexed because that it was said of some that John was risen from the dead. Now the Tetrarch is the governor of one of the four divisions of Israel. So what are the four divisions? This map tells us, right, these four divisions. There's one region that is led by Philip II, the Northern Territories. There's one region called Judea, Samaria, and Idumea under Herod Achilles. And then there's also a few cities where the Queen Salome I, who is Herod's sister, Herod the Great's sister, uh, receive revenues from the different cities like Jamnia, Exotus, and so on. And there is also an area that is governed by Herod Antipas, which is Herod the Tetra mentioned in Luke chapter 9 that we just read. Herod the Tetra is the Herod Antipas. He is in charge of the area called Galilee and Perea. Galilee and Perea. So these are the four regions, uh, rather three regions and some cities that, uh, 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 that are governed right, after the death of Herod the Great. Now I know by now you are a bit confused. Sometimes when you read the New Testament, there are so many Herods. <laughs> How many Herods are there? Many, right? And I'll introduce some of them to you, right? All right. So this chart will hopefully make it a little bit clearer. The Herod the Great, how many wives did he have? Ten wives. Wow. Right. That's why he has many, many right, children. Right. And then just now I mentioned Queen Salome the first, not the Salome that we will meet later on. Right. Queen Salome the first is the sister of Herod the Great. And that is why he also, she also received some revenues from some of the cities. Right, so it's kind of like one of the tetra. She's kind of one of the tetra. Sir. And then under Herod the Great, his sons, right? those in blue, the boxes in blue, Aristobulus, Herod Philip, Herod Antipas, Herod Achilles, Philip II. Not all of them govern parts of Israel. Right? In fact, out of his sons, only Herod Antipas, Herod Achilles and Philip II were given regions to govern. Right? Probably because they have shown or proven their leadership qualities, that they could be trusted to govern certain regions in Israel. Herod Philip was not a ruler. Aristobulus also was not a ruler. But he gave uh, birth to Herodias. And Herodias' daughter is Salome. Right? So the other Salome that you will meet later on. Now, Herod the Tetra, I mentioned earlier on in Luke chapter 9, is Herod Antipas, the one in the circle, right? Herod Antipas. So he's in charge of Galilee and Perea, right? And that is why he appears in this passage, because Jesus and the disciples were preaching through Galilee. And as, we, as they were preaching through Galilee, there were all these reports of healings and miracles that were done. People were being converted, People were following the disciples of Jesus. And that is why the news came to Herod, the Tetra, Herod Antipas, one of the Tetras. Okay? All right. Herod Antipas is also the one later on we will read. He is the one who will behead, or he has beheaded, John the Baptist. Right? He has beheaded, he killed John the Baptist. Why? Because... Of, okay, his two marriages, huh? Wait, before that, huh? <laughs> Herodias, huh? Now I introduce this Herodias, huh? Herodias actually, right, is the granddaughter of Herod the Great, okay? The daughter of Aristobulus, the son of Herod the Great. Herodias had a first marriage to Herod Philip, who is not a ruler. Divorced the first husband, married the second husband, Herod Antipas, while Herod Philip was still alive. So he married the wife of the half-brother. Right? I know some of you are scrunching your head. Huh? Right? In disapproval, right? Yeah. And that is why John the Baptist told him off, rebuked him, and says, you shouldn't do this. It's against the law, Moses. Your brother is still alive. You shouldn't take his wife. Right? So that was against the law. And for that, right, he was angry with John the Baptist, but not him who ordered the death, but actually the one who hated him most was Herodias. 
Now, why do I say that? Because in one of the feasts that Herod Antipas called, Herodias' daughter Salome danced before Herod Antipas, and she did such a wonderful dance that Herod Antipas says, Wow, oh, that was so beautiful. You ask me of a wish, and I will grant your wish. Right? Very dangerous to ask this kind of things. <laughs> to give this kind of very, very dangerous. And so what did she ask for? She was already coached by her mother who hated John the Baptist. Ask for the head of John the Baptist. He says, I want John the Baptist's head on a charger, on a plate. Delivered to me. And so Herod Antipas being the tetra of the region, with all the guests seated at the feast, felt embarrassed not to grant the request. He said, okay. And so John the Baptist was beheaded. Okay? All right, so that's the story. How many Herods are there? Some more Herods, okay? Okay. The story is not ended, huh? Philip II later on married his grandniece Salome. Right? This one, okay? Who danced very well, right? Okay, some more, Herod. King Herod Agrippa, right? The first, right? This is what you will see later on in the book of Acts. He executed James, the son of Zebedee. And his son, King Herod Agrippa II, will later hear the Apostle Paul's defense. All right? So, this is kind of the Herods that you will encounter in the book of the Gospels as well as the uh, New Testament. Now, this is Herod Antipas or Herod the Tetrarch that is mentioned in Luke chapter 9. He served as the ruler of Galilee and Perea from 4 BC to 39 AD, almost around the time of Jesus' life and ministry. Jesus died around 30, 30 plus uh, AD. Right, so almost around this time of Jesus. All right, I've entitled the next section, verses 7 to 10, as trusting God despite danger, because now you know that Christians are not the most welcome people in, around Galilee and around Jerusalem. There's a lot of opposition to Jesus and his disciples' ministry. Now, Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by Jesus and also Jesus' disciples, and he was perplexed because that it was said of some that John was risen from the dead because John was already dead. And of some that Elias had appeared and of others that one of the old prophets was risen again. And Herod said, John the Baptist have I beheaded. But who is this of whom I hear such things? And he desired to see him, referring to Jesus. And the apostles, when they were returned from all their ministries, told Jesus all that had, they had done. Right? So now you're seeing the picture. Why is there a danger? This is Herod Antipas, who had already beheaded John the Baptist. Now, he has nothing against Jesus, but he was curious about what Jesus had done. But Herodias, Herodias, his wife, right, is has something against John the Baptist and certainly against Christians who are disapproving of a relationship with Herod Antipas. But despite the various risks and opposition and persecution that Jesus faced wherever he preached the gospel, the opposition from the Pharisees, from the scribes, from the Sanhedrin council, from the chief priests, and also among the authorities, Despite all the risks that they faced and the opposition and the persecution, the apostles obeyed Jesus and they reported success in their ministry. So what are the lessons that we can learn from this short passage? All right, the first lesson, very simple. If you are called by God to serve Him, we know that we can trust Him. Wherever He sends us, He will also supply all our needs. So that we have the needs taken care of, we also have the gifts that is needed in order to serve Him. He will empower us 
to do his work with the spiritual gifts that he gives us. Lesson number two, the responsibility of the congregation to recognize the spiritual gifts among ourselves and our calling and encourage the young people to serve the Lord. That we are to call, send and supply the needs of the ministers and missionaries. And if you are financially endowed by God, then be hospitable to the ministers as well as the missionaries. Thirdly, God's servants need not fear the secular authorities that are appointed by the sovereign God. There are many other passages that tell us that it is God who has set up the kings and the authorities over us. Then, Although the secular authorities may not be Christian, and yet it is God who is sovereign over all things. God has set up the authorities to maintain law and order in our land so that we may also have the freedom of worship. And our responsibility as citizens of the country is to pray for our nation, pray for our government, that they will grant us the freedom of worship, the freedom to serve God. And God is just. Every king, even Herod Antipas, will be judged by God. In the way they treat Christians, in the way they oppose or support the ministries of God. And all of us are accountable to Jesus for our works and also our words. And it is God who works through us, weak sinners. The disciples are just ordinary people. We've learned that they come from all kinds of backgrounds. Some of them are uneducated, fishermen. They've never gone to the seminary. They've never gone to university. They're not highly educated. And yet God calls ordinary people from all walks of life to serve the King of Kings. And we are all weak sinners, but we can be empowered by God. And God will supply all our needs. And He gives us the privilege and the honour to serve Him so that He gets all the glory and not us. And when there is success in the ministry, we give all glory to God because we are enabled to serve the King of Kings because of the grace that He gives us, because of the zeal that He gives us, because of the Holy Spirit's power that He gives us. And so never underestimate the power of the gospel. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for your word that is true. We thank you for your word that challenges us to give our lives, to deny ourselves, to lay down our lives and present our lives as a living sacrifice on the altar so that we may give ourselves day by day to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Help us. We pray that you will help us to be faithful servants of yours, that even though we may not be in full-time ministry, Lord, use us and help us to discern your will so that we may be ready to give an answer of the faith, for the reason of the faith that we have, the reason of the hope that we have in Christ, that because we have believed in Jesus, we have hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ, who have died for us on the cross at Calvary. And Lord, we pray for some who are still outside Christ this morning, who have heard that only Jesus saves, that Jesus is the Savior of the world, that indeed we can find salvation in Christ alone. We pray that they will trust in Jesus to be the Savior and Lord, that we cannot find salvation through anyone else but through Jesus, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank you even for calling your servants in times past, for William Borden, who gave his young life to serve you day by day, reaching out to his classmates in the university and to the down and out in Chicago town, even giving his wealth and his time to preach the gospel. Lord, we thank you for their examples, for they have shown us what it means to deny themselves, to take up the cross and to follow Jesus, trusting in you to provide all that they need. Oh Lord, give us the faith to trust in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <music>